All right, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us for now, I believe, the 11th installment of our webinar series. Um, my name is Greg Amatia, and before we get started, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I also wanted to thank, um, oh, looks like I lost my that slide there, but I wanted to thank, before we get into our presentation, the Financial Planning Program at California Lutheran University for sponsoring this program. Um, we have two tracks. We have an MBA in financial planning, and we also have um, an MS. And so with that, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that at the end of the program. But with that, I'd like to introduce um, today's, ho or today's presenter, Jeffrey Lang. He's joining us again, talking about blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, Jeff is the director of supervision for the Southwest Division and financial planner of Lincoln uh, Financial Advisors, a registered investor um, advisor and broker dealer. He has been a member of the adjunct faculty for professional studies for the CFP program at the University of Baltimore and uh, Villa Julia College. He is frequently invited as a guest lecturer at the American College, the University of Maryland, the University of Baltimore, uh, as well as professional, professional associations. He's also one of our um, Cal Lutherans adjunct uh, faculty as well. And with that, Jeff, I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be uh, here today uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm developing a FinTech course uh, for later in the year for Cal Lutheran. And so this is a great opportunity for me to kind of test out all the material and to see if I can uh, put this very complex uh, topic into small chunks that are easily digestible. So um, if you wouldn't mind, I would love to go ahead and flip one slide. Uh, if you, uh, thank you very much. So I wanted you to look at this while I talk about something completely different. Uh, <laughs> the most important part here is that nobody really knows what blockchain is. Um, uh, well, maybe some people do. Uh, the most important thing on this slide is number two. There is a unique block that has what they call hashes and information. It's a basically, it's like a puzzle piece. It's a left piece and a right piece, and they got to fit perfectly. And if they don't, they don't fit. So what happens is, in this particular case, just to kind of give you a sense of generally how it works, because I want to take you off uh, task in a minute. So we're looking for a transaction. We create a block. It's unique. Uh, it's left piece and it's right piece, and the stuff in the middle, that's the information. Um, we want to put it on the chain, so we send it out to everybody. Everybody has a little bit of, a, of I say everybody, all the nodes, if you will, uh, they have a job to do. Uh, and if, if they come back with a consensus, then the block is added, meaning that it takes seven, eight, ten, fifteen thousand people all to agree. And that's how trust is created. And that's kind of important. So let me tell you why that's important here. Uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Satoshi Nakam Nakamoto, I guess. Uh, that, we think that's a, uh, a nom de guerre. We don't think that's his real name. Uh, and frankly, it could be a day. Uh, but what they did is they were they brought forward this concept um, that was as ancient. It's called the Byzantine general problem. And so not to give you more than you need to know, but this is a practical issue. So here's the deal. Three of us are going to attack a castle. And if, uh, if one of us doesn't bring their forces, we're not going to win. In fact, we're going to get slaughtered. It's going to be terrible. But I've got to trust that A, that you got my message, and B, that the message I got back is one I can trust. Could be that one of us is a traitor, one of us is a little scared, probably one of us is smarter than the others. The point was is that we can't do this unless all three of us have a, uh, a plan to attack and that our plan is clear. So we have a couple of things. One is, are we gonna be able to get consensus? The second thing is, is the consensus that I get in a form that I can rely on it. This is the foundational conversation about Bitcoin because it uses the masses, the multiple nodes, the wisdom of the crowds, if you will, and the uh, and, and, and frankly greed, which is kind of cool. We'll call that uh, cupidity for a minute. If you don't mind, flip to the next slide while I continue to talk about this a little bit. So here's the question. Would anybody do anything without a proper motivation? So Bitcoin is compensation for doing the work. Problem is, is that the value of Bitcoin um, is nowhere near the Bitcoin that you get. Uh, for doing the work is nowhere near um, that the cost of, of per se electricity uh, and computing power. So right now it's not a fair trade. So what I want to do is to kind of talk to you. Uh, I want you to look at this thing, but I want to talk about um, a little bit more background. So here's the deal. First of all, Bitcoin is designed as some sort of incentive. Eventually, um, all the Bitcoins will, will be uh, distributed. 
uh, all, all of the cryptocurrency, uh, you know, put it that way, will be distributed. And therefore, the rareness of it all uh, now, now gets to be a collectible and it gets to be rare and therefore potentially value um, uh, could. But, but still today, it feels pretty bad. Uh, I'm not sure if you all saw the article the other day. Forty million dollars of Bitcoin were hacked. You know, the idea of this is that it's safer, easier, bigger, better, faster. Uh, and it's still subject to some of the same risks that we had. People are still hacking um, uh, digital currency, and that's kind of a kind of an issue. So before we get into this slide, um, if you don't mind, by the way, I, I tend to go on long. So if somebody can wave at me or tell me when, when they've had enough of me, that's fine. But uh, what I wanted to talk about is, are three people or three concepts that I think are very helpful uh, in addition to the Byzantine general problem, which, by the way, if you think about it, it's, pretty, it's, it's an ancient problem. Uh, but, it, you know, you have to be able to figure out by the number of people and the ways that the answers come back in, whether or not you have consensus. Uh, and that's a big deal. But that is the whole essence, if you will, of the trust factor of blockchain. So I want to talk about three things uh, in anticipation of maybe this discussion. So first of all, we're going to talk about uh, placement. So information technology, if you will, has a place. Sometimes it's instead of us. If you haven't called your bank, uh, where they say, listen carefully because our our uh, choices have changed and stuff. They don't want to, they're not going to give you a person. This is instead of a person. And that's a very big deal in financial planning, by the way. Uh, we call it robo, hypothetically. Um, the second thing is, is maybe I'm going to use technology next to me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use my algorithms. I'm going to use my, uh, my calculations so I could uh, report to you with the technology how it looks if we make this choice or that choice. And that's a big deal, uh, particularly in, in, in my business, which is, you know, financial services. And then the second uh, and then the last part of that is whether or not um, there's information that is really, really good to have, but it's not really for the public. So, for example, back uh, probably 20, 30 years ago, I was hostile to the idea that we'd show anybody a Monte Carlo simulation. First of all, you can never rerun it and get the same answer. Plus, it's really hard to figure out. And um, it, it, my, my problem was it gave specificity to the fourth decimal place that you can't deliver. So it gave uh, your clients the expectation of specificity that you couldn't duplicate nor, nor uh, guarantee that you could uh, deliver. So again, very important. We have information behind this, makes us uh, feel much uh, more confident in our decisions. So hypothetically, you, you come up with a portfolio and you wanna see if it's gonna work, you run some calculations and you feel really good that, that the probability is that it would work this many times out of, uh, you know, out of 600, 700 times. So the point of that whole conversation is to be able to say that we have to know where the technology is and where it's best used. So let me sum up by saying this. The placement is either instead of you, alongside of you, or behind you giving you greater support. I'm hoping to talk about that a little bit later. I wanted to also talk about a guy by the name of John Nesbitt. In 1982, uh, right before he wrote the book with uh, Patricia Aberdeen, uh, which is called megatrends. Again, some of you are probably too young to, to, to remember that. But the point was he coined a phrase called high tech, high touch. And what he said is that we will generally not embrace technology that dehumanizes us. That we will generally embrace, well, in fact, we'll, we'll have not reject it, robo, uh, hypothetically. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, my, my feeling is uh, that you know what I mean whenever you get a robo call. Okay, when you're sitting down to dinner and, and some mechanical thing bothers you, um, there's a whole different attitude than if it's a person bothering you with a cold call at dinner time. So the point that I was making is high tech, high touch go together. So we have to see whether or not, and again, it has a lot to do with the placement. If I have got great technology and I can zip through a, a complex situation and I can describe it better so people can be more uh, elevated to make better decisions, that's awesome. It also is... Um, kind of hard to come by uh, sometimes. So we have to figure out as technology moves forward, is that against us, for us, and does it obligate us now to be something more? You know, as an advisor for 40 some odd years, um, I knew my job was to listen and to educate when necessary. But again, more, more importantly, is that I would listen. In this case, the technology allows us to gather information, do the analysis on the side. Now, all fairness, I got to pick on you a little bit uh, if you're in the business, because here's what my concern was. What I did is I explained to people that people aren't illiterate. They're generally enumerate. And by the way, to some extent, we're all enumerate. You know, big numbers, little numbers, uh, uh, future numbers, current numbers, numbers that we don't really want to talk about. Um, and maybe even the argument of the source of the numbers. You know, everybody knows it's on the Internet. 
So it has to be true. So one would, one would argue here in, in our conversation in terms of technology uh, is where the technology lies. So is it, is, it, is it behind us, supporting us? And here's my point. If every time we go to technology, it turns out to be a number and numbers aren't our favorite language or we're not very good at it, I would argue that we take numbers from them that they made up. Uh, and and uh, one example here, uh, Kelly, uh, I assume that you live in a house with, with other people. Will you all agree on the value of the house? So you, you so I ask you, what's the value of the house? You give me a value and I stick it in some computer. It does some weird thing. Uh, we didn't discuss it, by the way, what it was. Let's say we're doing a time value of money or, or net present value of a future sum or something. Uh, and my, my point was you didn't understand the number you gave me. You didn't really understand the thing I did to it. Now I'm supposed to get you to be excited about the number that I produced for you, right? I mean, so I put, I put the thing in there and it comes out. I go, see, Kelly, isn't that awesome? And I'm expecting you to be excited, so excited that you actually will take action on my advice. You see the problem? So, so this is about information, how fast it is and whether we're going to use numbers or use the language that we're supposed to, uh, to, to use. And the reason that's important is because if we get information, we should humanize it and deliver it in little pieces to people uh, so they can use it. Um, but many times uh, we are uh, thrilled by the new technology. So the last thing I wanted to mention before we get into to some of this, so a lot of this is just for your, your uh, gratification. Uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite person in investing uh, is uh, Warren Buffett, and not for the reason you think. I don't care how many billion he has. One of the things I really loved back in, uh, back in the 90s, he was invited to um, someplace called Sun Valley, and it's where it's an invitation only, billionaire club, and that kind of thing. And of course, he, he was there along with people like uh, Jobs and Gates and stuff. And he explained to people that, that, that we are misunderstanding the relationship between innovation, great innovation, and, and general wealth. So I'm going to kind of cut it short only to say this. Right now, we all know about Bitcoin, but you know there's 1,600 1,600 different distinct uh, simultaneous um, cryptocurrencies. Are, am I supposed to help you figure out which one is the one that's going to survive? Well, let me, let me help you. Okay, so it's not just that. How about car companies? How many were there at the turn of the century? Oh, there were a lot. How many are there now? Well, basically four or five, right? How about uh, airlines? So this is a uh, Warren Buffett is talking about that. Let's talk about trains. There used to be thousands of train related companies. Now there are only a couple. And so he said, and so, so his argument was, is that it's really hard to see how you make money from the two ne new technology. And of course they poo-pooed him and stuff, but then again, how many, uh, how many uh, organizations are as big as say Google, Facebook, you know, Amazon, if you think about it, this is a kind of a big deal. So one of the things I wanted to do is to remind you uh, in this, that we're all trying to find a place for this stuff. This, this uh, forget Bitcoin for a minute. Let's go back to um, blockchain. And remember that blockchain by its nature creates consensus and with that consensus is trust. We're, um, we're using that um, to, uh, to do something pretty amazing. Uh, the, the amazing thing for me is banking. And so what, what, you know, what, what would you say if I told you um, that uh, half of the world's uh, population doesn't have a bank account? That's wild. Well, how are they supposed to save and borrow and lend and invest? How are they supposed to do that if they don't have access? Well, with a smartphone and this new technology, we are opening up. In fact, uh, in the last two years, uh, 1.1 billion brand new banking customers are available online. Of course, this is, this is very much more important in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and there are seven uh, major uh, organizations. Um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll call them countries. I don't mean to, mean to you know, call them countries, but uh, economies uh, more than anything else. Uh, where they are really working on banking the population. And by having people participate in the population, in the, in the economy, um, it has a ripple effect. And so there's, there's just generally uh, some, some wonderful opportunities for the world to change a little bit. So we include more people in this stuff. So here's what, uh, and again, I'll, I'll let you see this, uh, this um, slide for just a second. Um, we want to know that um, you are you. So we have credential security. That's a big deal. Uh, maybe we have mobile apps. I know that I can't operate without my mobile app. Uh, you know, I deposit my checks by, by phone uh, these days. Uh, I can make a nonprofit donation. And so we're using all of these technologies um, uh, to, to do things that we always wanted to do. 
the least of which in my mind is the virtual currencies, this whole Bitcoin thing. Um, that has a lot of work uh, behind it, uh, but it also has a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. I'm trying to watch myself. Uh, by the way, so um, as you see here, uh, Bitcoin was um, not generally accepted, but over time you can see how the, the major operations, including PayPal in 2014, um, uh, accepted it. There are places where you can pay your taxes with Bitcoin. Kind of cool. So next slide, please. So that's uh, that's my reference to the 1600. Next slide, please. And then I'll uh, get to my uh, the meat of my conversation. Good. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there are disruptors and collaborators. So my my problem is this. So I'm, and this is the uh, the ending uh, of, of my my run up, if you will. So people ask me all the time about Bitcoin. Is that you know is that a good investment? I say, wow. My father used to say that it's not the bus you see, but the bus you didn't. Isn't it interesting that we're not interested yet in figuring out whether or not the companies and the industries that we have investments in, our clients have investment in, uh, we rely on this stuff. Um, but we may not be aware that some of these are under attack and some of them are going to be the victors of the future. So let's say that you already have a portfolio that have 450 uh, holdings. At what point do we as the an investor advisor have an obligation to think about? whether or not their advantage will stay for very long. Um, and, and frankly, I'm writing a paper on education, so I must tell you, I'm a little concerned about the long-term uh, value of the education that we get, unless you're going to continue uh, to become educated. It would be possible that we could have said we had a delta over, say, the um, high school uh, diploma uh, average income. Uh, if you run that out for 30 years, that's fine, but what happens if it only lasts eight? or four or five because of technology. You've got to change the net, the, you know, the, the uh, cost benefit analysis of that decision. Same thing happens in here uh, with banking and with, um, with cybersecurity and that kind of thing. So all of these things are uh, affecting or impacting in some way all of the companies we already know and love or ones that we might consider buying or selling. So I think that the opportunity here today is to understand that technology innovation um, is likely to shorten the amount of time that one can sit on a an advantage. And because of that, I think that that's the, the, the magic of, of our conversation, which is to say you're either going to be a victor or a victim. You know, if you want to meet me at Blockbuster, maybe we should talk about that. So anyway, so that's why I wanted to start. I thought I was just going to stir the pot a little bit and see what we can do to uh, to, to get some questions cranked up here. Oh, thank you so much. So at this time, we're going to open it up for questions. And uh, please, anyone, go right ahead. Uh, this is Kelly. And I'd like to ask, how long does it take for 15,000 people to approve you for this process? Um, not very long, because uh, we're up 24-7 all around the world. Uh, so it's uh, very, very fast. Uh, so it's almost instantaneous. I hate to call it that, but that's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the, the name. Uh, so we also have to understand there are lots and lots of, of people, and so only a fraction of people um, may be online at any one time. And so it doesn't take long at all. In fact, consider it instantaneous. Thank you. Really. Hey, Jeff, this is Kimberly. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. And Thank I can't you. wait to um, read your dissertation paper. It's nice having yeah, me you either. as a fellow cohort. <laughs> 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 Me too. Me too. No, yeah, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. So, so the question that I have is, uh, I'm still confused, and maybe you could just review again. Um, well, first of all, are you an investor yourself? No. No. In fact, I, I, I spoke to my colleague the other day, and I said it would be disingenuous for me to think about this uh, without at least trying. Um, you can get you can get you know five dollar stuff, but I, I thought that the Effort uh, was easy there, um, and then, so I did go through the process of figuring how long it would take me to get that. But I also have to tell you, I am part of a broker dealer, uh, and I have rules <laughs> because I'm in management, uh, and so I'm, I haven't checked with them yet as to whether I'm able to do it. But anyway, so very easy. El Toro, you can get on, take care of it in five minutes, and you can get almost anything that's on the exchange. Okay, and that's E L T E R O. Yes, yeah, 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 El Toro, or excuse me, E Toro, E T O R O. 
uh, and they're their biggest they're the biggest, biggest exchange. Um, uh, and and of course they once you um, let them know that you live, uh, your computer will follow you forever because <laughs> okay. they're really good at that. By the way, that's also blockchain. By the way, just so you know. So the you know the the uh, the ads that dog you after you check them once, they have algorithms for that. It's all pretty oh, uh, pretty okay. neat. Yeah, but but here's my problem. The problem is is unless unless they stop making them, it's kind of hard to know what the um, supply is. If you have a, a, a supply which is growing by quantum leaps minutely, um, how do how do you get any value out of that? Now, I mean, it would be kind of neat to maybe just own some things for the sake of owning it. Uh, but but it's not an investment. In this case, I call it a, it a, it a uh, an entertainment uh, factor. It's the stuff you want to chat about with your friends. But trust me, there's no investment part of that. And that's why I was saying that I believe that the most important part of this is to understand how the technology um, might uh, affect the the holdings that you already have and um, moving forward. But I would hate to be in uh, hypothetically banking, for example, uh, which used to be this, you know, it's, it's what you did when you didn't want to make a decision, right? And then you figure out that um, that, that the uh, e-banks are coming for you. And so a lot of the folks that have legacy customers also have legacy costs. They have legacy systems, and they're not nimble. And right now, nimble is a big deal. So we're, we're talking about unbundling, not to go too far, but to unbundling. It used to go be, be that you go to a bank, uh, all the things that the bank did, you would want them to do for you. And now what's happening is we're going – uh, to different organizations because they do that one thing better. And so and so banks uh, are either A, being disrupted, or B, they're collaborating and to try to bring some of these really cool services to, to their clients. Um, but, um, but anyway, so that's the point. This last slide tells you that there are these um, particular areas um, where you could either be disrupted or you could be the hero for a while, but okay, not for thank long. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Certainly. Thank you. Nice to talk again, please. Jeffrey, uh, John Teal here. Yes, sir. I uh, had a question about <clears throat> security. I, I remember you talked about hacking earlier, um, mm -hmm. and I was just curious when, when you were talking about hacking and people basically stealing currency, uh, was that more specifically related to an exchange than um, – the cryptocurrency itself and then the, the second it was that yeah. is do yeah. you think mm -hmm. that cryptocurrency or more specifically blockchain offers a type of security system that could be more advanced than just the regular passcodes or biometrics that we're using now absolutely is okay so let me answer it backward um i i think you're exactly right all the, where the hacking is being done is at exchanges and that's exactly right they had forty thousand just the other day and of course i'm preparing for our visit and I'm thinking, okay, what kind of security can I tell you that we have? The answer is, eh, I don't know. The hackers are pretty good, but, but it is the exchange uh, that, that creates the, the, uh, the challenge. Uh, and, and here's what happens. Bitcoin uh, is, it's just one of many, but it's the first, but, but for example, you can go to Ethereum and Ethereum has a, a, a an opportunity. They call it a self uh, closing contract. And so you, you can know that if you bought a piece of property, uh, and in the blockchain, the money was transferred, it would automatically uh, confirm that the title was transferred. And so they, they do all kinds of things, and they could be wonderful um, uh, in terms of, of uh, cutting out the middleman. In fact, governments are using them uh, to run their uh, bureaus of licensing. Uh, the hospitals are using them to protect their health records. Uh, and in fact, one of the uh, last uh, lectures that I do in my, in my course is the 50 industries, 50. Uh, that are um, uh, impacted. You know, it used to be that we would trust um, government and big companies. Now we don't trust anybody. We, in fact, you know who we trust? We trust um, <laughs> we, we, we trust complete strangers, right? I mean, you uh, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. We don't know these people. Why would we trust them? And the answer is because we have an algorithm that says that we can trust them, and we seem to be comfortable with that. So I like the idea that we can. So so um, we can develop more and more sophisticated things, particularly for particular uh, purposes. Uh, but protecting medical records is a big deal. Completing contracts, uh, verifying identity is a big deal. It is a very big deal. And so I would argue in this case that we are, uh, we, meaning the, the world, is better off for the idea that innovation uh, is the name of the game. But, but it's about uh, security. It's about speed. It's about cost. Um, and, and imagine that you're competing with somebody who has all those things and you don't have it. 
imagine that you own three stocks and two of them are looking pretty good, but one of them is going to get its, its, uh, you know, its, its day um, uh, ruined because uh, their unique ability has been supplanted by some uh, technology. So imagine that. So you know, I'm kind of open to the idea, but I can tell you that they, the, the uh, technology, um, one to, to hack and then the other uh, to, uh, to disrupt uh, is a big deal. And so the question is this, do you think we ought to invest in the technology in the, in the cryptocurrency or the companies using the technology to maintain a, uh, an edge? What do you all think? I think the technology, technology, the companies that's using the technology. Right. So that, that's diversifying yeah. into both. Agreed. And so if you think about it, even those who might be disrupted may be motivated then to do something. So, so in banking right now, what we have is bundling and unbundling. So what happens is, you know, we've had, um, you know, M&T Bank and some major lending uh, people have, um, uh, worked with smaller um, fintech companies to deliver a thing that they do really, really well. And so they're now a collector of these best practices, best uh, applications, as opposed to why don't you use ours? Uh, and so the question is whether or not their, their legacy um, systems are a positive or a negative. But um, I love the idea. And again, one of the reasons I got into uh, this was to, to think about the uh, unbanked and the underbanked. This is a big deal. Um, when, when people can't save and invest and lend and invest, how are they supposed to be a part of the economy? So more and more people are now being able to, to, uh, to participate. And, and that has a ripple effect. It could be huge over time. But it also has a negative effect I mean, in my world is I'm saying to you that I'm, I want to give you value, uh, a unique ability. I want to give you um, legacy knockoff. So, for example, if I say this unique thing that you can do and only you can do, but it's only going to last three years, I've got to value that differently than if it's going to last eight years. So, you know, call it Moore's Law. And, and imagine that if you pay for an education where the delta, the, va the advantage is, is less, um, less certain longer term. It, it puts a premium on being nimble and using that as a base to continue to innovate. Does that make any sense at all? Y'all y'all okay with that? Yes. Okay. So I know it's not what you all were thinking about. I'm hoping to tell you that uh that the cryptocurrency is an interesting uh concept. Uh unless you're gonna use it to pay something, uh it's entertainment. I mean I used to buy Starbucks stock so I could tell people about it, but not because it was a great stock, uh, although it was. Uh but the point in this case um is see what would families think about millennials and the things that they value. You know, being nimble and uh, creating algorithms and um, uh, services that they're gonna value, pretty important. So I think you're gonna find this to be generational. You're gonna find it to be either uh, Internet of Things. Uh, for example, there's a, there are a number of, of governments uh, that are all really, really big on tracking who owns what land. Pretty big deal. And then you got the people at DMV uh, and, and stuff. So I like the idea that, that um, and, and that, that whole Byzantine general thing really blew my mind because I'm thinking, okay, how do I solve that? Well, mathematically, if you do that with 6,000 people versus two, I mean, the, the likelihood that you could fake that is very, very, very low. And that was the, the, the point. The point was you can't fake it because when you change one thing, you change everything. And now your change doesn't make sense anymore. And therefore, it's not valid. So you can't change anything. And imagine you have a chain that's, I don't know, 10,000 characters along and you change number eight, it's now gone. It's now not correct. The math won't work. You with me so far? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Debbie. Thank you. Um, if, unless anyone has any other questions, we're gonna wrap up. So if you have one last question you wanna get in, I would say get it in now. Well, one thing I want to say is, is I agree with you, Jeff. I'm already seeing so many different companies using um, blockchain for different things like monitoring diamonds. Um, I think, Greg, you experienced um, going to one of the, um, the, the lettuce producers in the area. The and avocado they, producers, yeah, one of the large avocado, um, they, they utilize blockchain. To, to, to keep track of where they... 
um, got the those avocados from. And Absolutely. Narrow it down exactly where it came from. And that's going to be helpful, by the way. They're also using that with opioid um, um, drug interdiction, which is a big deal. I mean, if you ever thought about that, you're thinking, where did that lot come from? Uh, how do you track it? Uh, you know, uh, they call that tooth to tail, um, you know, in, in uh, supply line and in logistics uh, and, and that kind of thing. So it would be um, incredibly important uh, for us to understand um, that we needn't be afraid of robots. Uh, I don't know about you, but you know I'm still playing video games because I'm. And my wife is still afraid of robots, uh, and um, right now we're trying to figure out the gentle thing. So when I call for an Uber, and I know that the blockchain tells me, um, gives me confidence that the person who's coming is the person I think is coming, that's a big deal. So I think we're going to do more of that. But anyway, the argument that I want to make is that I, my dad said it's not the bus you see, but the bus you didn't. I think we already have portfolios. We already have companies, we have industry, we have governments, we have disruption, we have innovation, and, and more importantly, I didn't want to leave this out, we have regulation. And we're either going to have positive regulation or we're going to have the stuff that's stymie stuff. And I can tell you, within seven of the biggest economies, they are working on regulations that are positive uh, and um, helping us to develop this. In a little while, a lot of this will be um, pretty um, average. It'll be normal. It'll be okay to buy a cheeseburger with a ripple uh, or an ethereum or a quarter of a bitcoin or something and so it'll be normal so in terms of remittances but I, the reason i showed you that one slide is paypal and apple pay uh these people are are, are already free to accept compensation uh their compensation their their remittances uh in um in crypto but how can you accommodate 1600 of them so there's got to be winners and losers there's got to be beta and bhs right they got the uh, European plug and the U.S. plug. You got uh, AC or DC. You with me? So there are going to be winners and losers. How do you decide? And the answer is that you, have, you just play the game. Uh, but I believe that is, uh, you know, Walmart many years ago was the number one purchaser of technology because they said they couldn't rely on people. Uh, they needed to, and, but they, they spent a lot of money. Now their costs um, are substantially under their competitors because of their investment. I see that same kind of thing happening. Uh, but more importantly, um, I love the idea of thinking about the companies um, uh, and what they can do for us. But but the innovators are going to find a way to help us buy cohort. We're going to look at the uh, the Gen Xs and Gen Zs, and even even the old guys like me. They're going to try and figure out a way to bring me something that I've been looking for uh, in a more narrow fashion. Not banking in general, but that particular service that guys like me would would find valuable. Um, and they're going to do it through fintech companies. They're going to say, develop this for us, develop it with us. And we're going to find out that um, this is how um, mega banks that either have uh, large money uh, pools or large um, client pools uh, are going to be able to deliver the very best, uh, not by competing, but by uh, collaborating. Hmm. Wow. Well, so, uh, Sabbath, I, I hopefully um, um, uh, I see um, there was a question. Hopefully I answered it. I'm, I'm hoping I did. Um, oh, yeah, you said uh, yeah, you talk about uh, remittances, whether or not you can pay uh, your taxes and pay for food. And basically we're arguing whether or not uh, we're ready yet to say um, that this stuff has a use for not only the storage of value, but the transfer of value. Uh, and uh, the, the answer is a couple of these are already ready. But how do you how do you get sixteen hundred? Uh, different ones to 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 be you know usable um so i think there's going to be winners and losers i think that warren buffett was correct um that that every we think that every great innovation okay is um is going to make everybody rich and i would argue that that hasn't happened in the past and is likely not to happen now so that's it for me wow i look forward to the class we're putting together for cal lutheran because this sounds Fascinating. I can try to learn more about all this. I feel like all day I can try to learn more about not only blockchain, but where the cryptocurrencies and how all of this is going to play into the future. Well, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm still working on it, but I hope to be ready soon. And I got to tell you, the people working with me, hope it's ready soon, too. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for who um, that attended today's forum. Um, what I missed in the beginning, I'm going to say now. I want to thank, once again, Cal Lutheran for sponsoring these webinar series. Um, we obviously have two tracks, the MBA 
in financial planning, which provides um, business and practice management skills for those working in the profession. It also helps students prepare to sit for the CFP exam or will further the knowledge of those already holding the CFP designation. Then we have our MS in financial planning, which focuses on that art and science of financial planning and client communication. If you have any questions at all, you're interested in learning more, um, or you just want to chat more about any of these topics, you can reach out to our director, um, Dr. Chen, or our program manager, Cindy Grether, for more information. And you can follow that link below and just learn more about the FP program. Uh, once again, Jeff, thank you so much for another exciting um, presentation. And to everyone else, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.